right, welcome to using Looker to empower cloud financial decisions. Companies on average use four different FinOps tools according to a recent survey by the FinOps Foundation. And these could be third-party providers, these could be homegrown or native to the cloud providers. Now when I heard this four number, I was surprised. It seemed a bit low, as some companies have told me they use 10 or more tools to perform their FinOps activities. Now, a big reason behind this is that many tools are point solutions. They solve for just one or two use cases. Looker is a powerful platform that solves across numerous use cases in cloud cost management, and that's what we're here to talk to you about today. So what we hope you'll take away from this session First is some exciting and pressing results from CME Group who implemented this solution. And then we'll walk you through the roadmap behind that as well as building blocks of the products that comprise it. And just a note to please save Q&A, we have mics up front for the end. My name is Sherry Cunningham. I'm team lead for FinOps at Google Cloud. I sit within professional services. We work with customers on, for example, developing FinOps operating models, implementing in-depth cost optimizations, as well as Looker cloud cost management implementations such as you'll see today. I'm also joined here by my colleague Rupa Patel, who's a senior product manager at Google, as well as Kevin Krantz, director of FinOps, who was deeply involved in many of these results you'll see today. Thanks, Sherry. All right, well, welcome everybody, and thank you for being here today. Um, as Sherry mentioned, I'm Kevin Kranz. I'm director of FinOps at CME Group, and I've been in the IT financial management space for about 14 years. And in the last year and a half, I've been helping CME stand up a FinOps operation. And for those of you that don't know who CME Group is, we're the world's leading derivatives marketplace, and we have products like the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, Gold, copper, silver, corn, cattle, soybeans, wheat. You guys get the picture. We have a lot of products. But the reason we're here is to learn about the cloud. And in 2021, CME partnered with Google uh, to bring all of our applications to the cloud. And in 2022, we were fortunate enough also to uh, partner with Google's PSO team to help stand up our FinOps operation. So over the next 12 minutes or so, I'm going to take you through three examples that CME has uh, used Looker to drive cloud cost management. And when people think about BI tools like Looker, you tend to think about graphics and data and metrics, and that's true, that's all there. But we find at CME that there's more than that to using a tool like Looker. Uh, we're, we're finding that it helps drive what I like to call the three C's of Looker. And that's uh, cost awareness, collaboration, and cultural change. All right, the first scenario I have for you is uh, with BigQuery storage. So at CME, one of the first things we did was migrate data from on-prem to BigQuery storage. And when we did that, the teams were excited because you know, they're getting their hands dirty for the first time with, big, uh, with GCP in general. So the, uh, the excitement was high. And on the FinOps team, we were excited too because we're seeing data come through the billing file. And we're also seeing reports light up in Looker like you can see on the screen here. In this graphic, you could see the line, the line graph that's representing the number of gigabytes that were being the, uh, stored in BigQuery. And then the bar graph is what is the total cost of that storage. And when we look at that number together, we're seeing the cost per gigabyte. And for us, that happened to be a lot more expensive than we originally anticipated. And that's when we knew there had to be a better way forward. So from there, we teamed up with Google and our internal engineers to understand what a better path forward could be. And that's when we found there's two different ways to store data in BigQuery. You have the logical format and the physical format. And in the physical format, you take advantage of Google's data compression technology. And lucky for us, our data happens to be highly compressible, so it made sense for us to make that change. So we simply did that, and I say simply because I didn't do the work, but the dev teams were the ones who moved the buckets from logical to physical, and we saw a 60% reduction from our initial deployment cost. And you can see that result clearly in this graphic where the Gigabyte stored stay high, and the cost comes pretty low. 
So I'm going to bring you back to those three C's that I mentioned, because we see two of them already. We see cost awareness based on the graphic, and we also see the collaboration, because at the end of the day, the FinOps team can't do this work themselves. We need the partner with all of our technology staff to make sure the, you know, the opportunities that we're seeing through these graphics are actionable and that they won't impact performance of our applications. So that collaboration is extremely vital here. And the other thing that's interesting here is the third C, cultural change. And if you were at CME, what you would have seen is people asking questions. How did they save the 60%? What kind of data are they seeing? Can we have access to Looker and see what they're seeing? We want to be a part of this movement. So that was the cultural change, like kind of taking place right before our eyes, which was amazing. The second scenario I have for you is GCS storage tiers. Now I'll jump to the chase on this one. We were originally in the standard storage tier, and we went down to the cold line tier, and we saved 66%. Probably no surprise to anybody here, because you've probably been there, done that. But for CME, it was interesting, because as a FinOps practitioner, we're watching the cost rise for GCS. At the same time, we're seeing costs rise in BigQuery storage. And we were just curious to know why that would be. And we just didn't know the full architectural plan behind this. So when we met with our engineers, we found that GCS was going to be a landing zone for uh, data being moved over to BigQuery. And that at the end of the day, the, big, uh, the uh, GCS storage would be backup storage for, for BigQuery. So once we realized it was going to be a backup storage solution, we knew we could safely walk down those tiers. So that was a 66% reduction in our cost. But the really cool thing here was the cultural change that took place. Because when the engineers started feeling like they were being pulled into the fold of FinOps, they, they started putting their engineering hats on and started thinking about automation. And that's exactly what they did. They automated our storage lifecycle policies, which start automatically walking down those tiers of storage to take advantage of the lower cost prices over time when they see no access patterns on that, uh, that data in GCS. So again, we could see those three Cs take place in this scenario as well. The third scenario I have for you is cloud logging. This one's a little different than the first two because it's not a huge cost reduction. However, if you look at the first graphic on the left, that's cloud logging, and you can clearly see the spike there. And I was able to drill into that spike in Looker and find the project ID that was causing the spike. And I took that information to the, to the Logs Explorer in the console, and I found the application ID that was uh, contributing to that spike. And from that, I was able to find out who the application owner was. And then we had a discussion to, to understand more about what was happening with his logging. And to all of our surprise, the development team didn't even know this kind of logging was happening. And we went, when we looked in the council, we saw 1.4 billion logs being produced in an hour. And that was a pretty big number to me. I, I didn't really have a reference uh, for logging, but we were all surprised by that. So anyway, the developer was able to go into the system and make adjustments, and you could see the, the logging spike go away. But we still needed to understand more about logging, so we teamed up with our SRE team, because those, those are the guys that are going to be responsible for kind of rolling out the logging service at scale. And right away, engineers being engineers, they knew they or felt they were being pulled into this FinOps fold. They automated as well. So they started doing anomaly detection at the log level to hopefully prevent large logging events from making their way into the billing file and showing up as real cost. So if you notice on the screen, I have two graphics. One, the one on the left is cloud logging, and the one on the right is BigQuery streaming inserts. And if you notice, the pattern on both of these is exactly the same. And that just made me curious, and I had to dig in further. So I met with my development teams to understand why this might be. And that's when they informed me that we're taking all of our logs and streaming them over to BigQuery. So from a FinOps perspective, I'm thinking, OK, we're paying for logging fee. We're paying for BigQuery streaming inserts. We're paying to store the data in BigQuery as well. But they also told me we're storing the same data in GCS. And when we looked, it's in the standard storage tier. So you can see we have a ton of optimization on our hands. And the team is actively working on this now. And actually, this week, they, they have released some, uh, some really impressive results on reducing all these costs for us. Um, but again, through this situation, you can see the three Cs play out. You have the cost awareness through the graphics. You have the, col the collaboration, because it takes a team of people to make this stuff real and actionable and to be able to see the real cost savings that are in front of us. 
And also you have the cultural change, which is highly important. So now all of our dev teams are being more cost aware, more cost conscious, and they're putting their skills to use by automating a lot of this for us. So I'll end there. Um, and I just want to remind you of the three C's because really what I'm finding with uh, any visualization tool, really, but with Looker, that's what we use, um, it's been impressive to see these three C's play out. So I'm gonna pass it over to Sherry, who's gonna walk us through a little bit more detail on how CME was able to stand up Looker and use the billing file to make all this possible. Thank you. 60% savings, Kevin. Excellent, 60% savings. Kudos to the entire CME team for contributing to that. Now moving from on-prem to the cloud, we know this turns engineering and architectural decisions into cloud purchasing decisions. This is what makes that culture of FinOps so important. And one of the biggest ways to drive that culture is to have concrete results to show people what the impact is of their efforts. And having these results, this data requires a tool such as Looker to get there. So starting on our crawl, walk, run journey. When we start with crawl, we recommend starting just with one cloud as that strong base of a platform. We'll talk about multi-cloud in a bit. Behind this, there's also the need to develop personas. So each persona should view different types of data, different insights. Executives should not be viewing the same insights as cost optimization analysts. It's also important to know that crawl does not mean low impact. I worked with a company recently to implement crawl over the course of a few months, and they took their month-end billing invoice process from working with various teams to get inputs and approvals, took that from three weeks down to two days. Also behind the crawl phase, it's critical to have really strong metadata. Metadata can come in the form of tags, or labels. It's not a one-time effort. It's more of ongoing automations. We recommend upfront in the actual provisioning of resources to automate with Terraform templates or some other sort of automation to include those tags and labels. And then further down the stream, implementing automations for compliance checks of that metadata. Within Looker, you could also create a compliance dashboard that shows teams where on the project level, on the resource level, they're missing tagging and labeling compliance. This is just another way to motivate teams to increase their metadata across the platform so that you have better insights. Now getting into walking with Looker. This is where multi-cloud starts to come into play. You can harmonize across the clouds to know what cloud storage is on one cloud versus the other versus the other. And later, Rupert will talk about an exciting effort with the FinOps Foundation called Focus to develop billing standards across clouds that'll make these harmonization efforts even easier for you. Also within Walk, you have more granular insights in cost optimization, such as what Kevin shared earlier today. And then finally, you have showbacks and chargebacks. Many companies are, are doing this manually at the end of the month, developing invoices, sending them out to various cost centers. Within Looker, you could set up a one-time automation that can send monthly to however many cost centers you decide. It can include both direct and shared service costs. Getting into the run phase of Looker. This is where you start to make the data more opinionated. You can develop efficiency KPIs such as what is your cost per core or unit economics metrics such as your cost per transaction. And not only can you have these more opinionated metrics, but you can also develop benchmarks to start tracking your progress over three months, six months, 12 months, et cetera, to see how you're actually progressing as a cloud in efficiency. Also part of this run phase is forecasting. We see many companies have at least 10% of forecast variance to actuals. And with a tool such as Looker, where you can tune models, add your own business logic, you can significantly bring up that forecasting accuracy. 
And then there are integrations. With Looker, you can integrate with Slack, Jira. Within Jira, you can, for every cost optimization recommendation, create a ticket that goes to the workload owner and actually track when they're acting on cost optimization recommendations and over time see where you're having impact or not. CME Group is embarking on implementing many of these run phase items and we're really excited to see where they take their journey. So if you're like me, you've probably spent a half a day or entire days tracking down anomalies, trying to determine why they occurred, putting together a plan promising why it'll never happen again. I'm excited to announce we now have a cost anomaly with generative AI solution. So this is not only identifying anomalies with our BigQuery ARIMA Plus model, but also using generative AI, our Palm APIs, in order to tell you both reasons for why the anomaly occurred, as well as suggested recommendations on how to, to fix it. Now this is multi-cloud as well. It doesn't have to be implemented just within Google Cloud on Google's data. You can do it elsewhere as well. So you no longer need to be a data scientist to tackle cost anomalies. Now imagine a day where there's a cost anomaly and you or the workload owner gets an email saying there's been an anomaly, but no fear, here's likely why it happened and how you can fix it. These are all meant to save you and your teams time to resolution on anomalies. So now I'll hand it to Rupa to talk about the building blocks behind this journey. Awesome, thank you so much, Sherry. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the building blocks of a successful implementation, specifically talking about what tools Google Cloud has to offer. Just a little bit of background about me. I work in product management. Specifically, I work on the billing console and our programmatic exports of cost data to BigQuery. So a little bit about, nope. Sorry. A little bit about our building blocks for a successful implementation. How do you actually build uh, implementation using Google Cloud? Well, there's a couple building blocks. First and foremost, BigQuery. BigQuery is a serverless scalable solution for your data, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. We also offer a ton of exports, so you can actually get your cloud billing data and contractual pricing through our BigQuery exports and those, that data is actually enriched and democratized for your organization. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then metadata, Sherry touched a little bit upon this, but it's really important to map your organizational structure to the Google Cloud constructs that already exist, so you can actually make the most of understanding your cloud cost data. So BigQuery exports data automatically throughout the day. So if you enable BigQuery export, and I'll show what exports we actually have available in a second, you can actually see your costs automatically throughout the day. The benefits of BigQuery is it's a fully managed enterprise data warehouse solution that actually lets you manage your uh, data and analyze it. Its serverless architecture makes you, let, allows you to basically SQL query on that cost data and there's zero infrastructure management. So once you actually enable it, it scales as you scale. So with BigQuery, you can actually query terabytes of data in seconds or petabytes of data in minutes. And BigQuery is, the, is one of Google's premier solutions for data querying and, and storage. So I'll talk a little bit about how you can actually use Google Cloud tools to analyze uh, cloud and uh, cloud costs and pricing data in a second. Um, but primarily, you can use a tool like Looker um, to visualize your data that sits on top of BigQuery, as Sherry had talked about previously. So some of our exports, we offer three exports today. We offer our standard billing export. In this export, you can get access to cost, credits, usage, region-related data, labels, tags, and the list goes on, projects, folders, et cetera. Um, standard billing export is a really important export to enable. You can directly enable it from your billing console in one click, so pretty straightforward solution. Um, and it allows you automatically throughout the day to see your costs. Detailed export has the same data as standard export, 
but it also offers granular cost details. So if you think about well, what is granular cost data, think about for Kubernetes, how would you be able to see cluster namespace and pod level data? For Compute Engine, how might you actually see VM cost level data? So detailed export actually gives you detailed granular costs. And lastly, our pricing export. Our pricing export allows you to get details about your contractual pricing, so your list price, your discounts, et cetera. More recently, we just launched the ability to join the detailed export and the price export, so you're able to see price in line with your costs. So an another thing is you can actually scan this QR code and get access to our documentation, which shows you our schemas. So you can see our schemas related to standard export, detailed export, pricing, et cetera. One of the things that Sherry touched on previously was the concept of FOCUS. We are actually working with the FinOps Foundation on FOCUS, and FOCUS stands for FinOps Open Cost and Usage Specification. In June, we launched the V0.5 specification. I helped actually core contribute to this specification. Later this year, we're gonna launch the actual V1 um, standard. So what actually is a standard? Well, across cloud providers, AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud, we all have our own constructs of how we assign data, right? If you think about cost, credits, usage, we all have different languages for how, you know, how these basic con concepts um, are defined. And so with Focus, we actually are standardizing all of these definitions across cloud providers. So if you actually go ahead and take a look at the Focus standard, you can see how we've aligned all of our languages across the three major cloud providers. Google is also a premier sponsor of the FinOps Foundation. We work very close with the foundation on standardizing this billing data. Um, we we have worked on Focus for a pretty long time now, so we're excited in November to release the, the next version of this. One of the things I wanted to touch on related to our exports is granular costs. So I mentioned that detailed export allows you to see resource level costs, right? Subservice level costs as it relates to really, really granular costs. Um, so later this year, we're gonna launch a couple big service, services for granular costs. Just this month, we actually launched BigQuery data set and job level costs. So you can actually go into BigQuery detailed export and see those costs. And later this year, we're gonna be launching a couple new services like Dataflow, cloud logging, Bigtable, cloud functions. So you're able to actually get granular subservice level costs for those services. And in 2024, we're gonna continue our journey and our roadmap to deliver more granular costs. This is really important as you think about the use cases related to cost visibility and cost allocation. And of course, all of the other use cases that um, Sherry and Kevin have mentioned related to cost anomaly detection, forecasting, et cetera. So really excited uh, to be releasing those things this year. Regardless of if you label it or not, you'll be able to see this data in detailed export. One thing I wanted to touch on is tagging. Late last year in September, we released tags. Tags is beneficial for a couple reasons. Tags, first and foremost, has really strong governance. So tags allows you to actually create a tags admin, viewer, and user. The reason why that's really beneficial is if you think about a developer labeling a resource, a developer may delete that label by accident, right? But if you have tags, you can actually ensure that you can only remove that tag off of a resource if you have permissions to do so. So that creates really reliable cost reporting. Additionally, you're able to actually create tag bindings. So you can only put a tag on a resource if you have permissions to do so. Same thing with removal. The, another benefit of tags is you can, it also has inheritance. So if you assign a tag to a folder, for example, all the children resources underneath that folder will inherit that tag value. And lastly, tags has an enhanced character set. So tags allows you to incorporate characters like the at sign or the period. So that's really useful if you want to put your developer's email address as a tag value onto that resource. So if you wanna read more, I've attached the white paper we've written about tags and some of the benefits that you can actually gain.